From the University of California's California China Climate Institute, this is Climate Dialogues with Jerry Brown. In episode 10, Institute Chair Jerry Brown speaks with Carla Peterman, Executive Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Chief Sustainability Officer for Pacific Gas and Electric. The pair discuss key issues facing California with respect to climate change, including catastrophic wildfires, renewable integration with the grid, and building grid resilience, and incentive structures to advance a cleaner energy future. Listen to their conversation now. Good to uh, speak with you. And uh, in the next half hour, let's go over some of the key issues facing California with respect to climate change. Now, I think I should start because when I first met you, uh, you were touted as an expert in photovoltaic. I don't know whether you got your, your advanced degree in that, but I think that you're supposed to know a lot about that. So let me just start right there. I, I'm, I know you know a lot about that, um, more now than you did 10 years ago when I first met you. So where are we uh, on solar energy uh, within California? Well, uh, solar energy still remains our um, dominant renewable energy source that we're adding to the grid. And it has a major um, contribution to our state. So we're seeing significantly reaching higher levels of solar hitting records every day, which is great. So solar's a big contributor as is wind. And we still also rely on some of our other renewable resources. Um, like bioenergy and geothermal as well. But now what happens if we get uh, 10 million uh, electric cars and they're all being charged? Uh, is that viable uh, just using solar and wind? As long as we plan well, it is. So what we've been doing at the utilities is making sure that we're setting rates where people charge in a time of the day where we have a lot of solar power. So encouraging, for example, a lot of workplace charging and now that people are working more from home during COVID, encouraging charging during times of the day when we have a lot of solar. So the cost of power is cheaper during the day when we have a lot of solar, and it gets more expensive later in the day when the sun goes down. And what happens when we're in foggy winter days? So that's where energy storage comes into play. So one of the things that I was privileged to work on at the PUC was implementation of AB 2514 which directed the PUC to consider setting targets for energy storage. And so California was actually years ahead in terms of setting targets for utilities to build energy storage. So we've got a lot of energy storage on our system and that's allowing us to store some of that sunlight and use it during uh, the evening hours. Uh, but just looking down the road when we're supposed to be 100% uh, renewable, uh, can you even imagine that in the next, 20, 30 years? Is that viable given the, the, the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow, um, the grid? Tell me, do, 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 what, what, what do you think? I mean, where, is this a viable, we, we, because of climate change, we have to get to zero carbon. But can you even imagine as you're sitting here today, how that can be done? You know, actually I can. And first of all, I can imagine it because as you said it, it has to be done. But I remember when it seemed that getting 10% of our power from renewable was impossible. And then we got the 20% RPS, and then we got the 33% RPS. And when I started working on these issues 15 years ago, solar was five or six times the cost it is now. Energy storage wasn't even an option because it was so expensive. So I think we can get there, but it's gonna take a combination of resources. It's not just solar. It's also going to be storage. It's going to be things like hydro, um, you know, biomethane, and also demand response. What we've got to be able to do is have customers manage their consumption and getting customers to consume when we have a lot of power and consuming less when we don't has got to be a part of the solution. And is there a big, can you make an estimate of how much uh, controlling, getting consumers to reduce their demand uh, at times of stress, uh, how big could that be? What would, can you give me some measure or equivalent well, how big that could be? So I mean, I say the potential is significant. Last year when we were having 
Um, so supply shortfalls. When we had our reliability events last August, we saw almost a gigawatt of demand response from customers. And that was without even having automated technology and devices. So I think when we talk about the next generation of demand response, we got to have residential customers, small commercial customers with automation, with the ability to ratchet down their energy consumption and not have the impact. We do need to move away from relying on our big industrial and commercial customers uh, from doing significant demand response and really starting to just internalize this via technology. All right, you said a gigawatt. How about 10 gigawatts? Is that so conceivable? I, so I don't have in my mind how much our residential customers consume, but I will say an order of magnitude more than what we're getting is possible. Um, because there that'd, is- the, that'd, be 10, that'd be 10 gigawatts? Yeah, but don't quote me on that. You should find someone who's got that statistic and I'm happy to track it down, but we can do more with demand response and we have to. So I, I'm off the grid here as I'm talking to you. And when we get uh, uh, cloudy days or uh, what have you, uh, we reduce our demand. Uh, now, I don't want to turn off my refrigerator or my freezer, uh, but we have a, a variety of activities that we can stop. We don't, char we don't charge the car. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't run the dishwasher. Uh, we don't turn on the toaster. Uh, these are all things, uh, and if it turns the temperature, you can obviously, if it's 78, uh, you find out we, when it was really hot here uh, for the air condition, we go up to 81 uh, and we could even go higher. And I'm sure that if uh, the system could make it worthwhile, that there's some people would say, okay, I like it at 75, but if you pay me enough, I might be willing to live at 80, uh, my house with 83, right? That, that, so I, I think there's a tremendous gain here because I think people, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people will tolerate uh, a, a warm house uh, for money or some savings, and that's the money equivalent. And uh, that's the way, I, I know it's there. If you can get uh, the system, I guess you need the software, the yeah. technology, and then you just have to put the incentives into place. Yeah, I agree. And there are business models that are designed around this. So you have companies out there that are using marketing techniques to get customers together and then they aggregate that demand and they bid that into the Kaiso market where they're saying, hey, here's how much reduction I can offer. I think one of the nuances though I will say is around climate change and heat. So when we see stress on the system, it's often at times when we're having heat waves. And that's the same time where that's putting stress on transmission, distribution lines and demand is going up. So there is a question about if customers are going through a heat wave, how inclined are they gonna to be to reduce their usage? And so understanding consumer behavior has gotta be a big part of uh, meeting this need. And I also just say, what we really need to focus on is economy-wide carbon neutrality. And so there may be room to have some use of fossil fuels in the electric and heating sector for um, you know, a unique set of uses. But what we need to be able to do is use electricity to decarbonize other parts of the economy more significantly. So like that's why we're very bullish at pg e on electric vehicles, because there's the opportunity. Transportation is our biggest contribution to greenhouse gases in the state. So the more we can electrify our vehicles, then that can actually have some real positive um, impact in addition to decarbonizing our supply. Does, uh, does it a gas electric company have any kind of a program to accelerate electric vehicles? Uh, there's a one point where there was an idea the utility would own electric vehicles. I've heard that idea, but what, what uh, more radical or far reaching ideas are out there to accelerate the uh, introduction of electric cars? So all the utilities have programs that are focused on building electric vehicle charging. In fact, we recently just finished our first program that was significant scale that got approved back um, over four years ago. So we had a four year program. We just completed it. And as part of that program, we installed almost 5,000 electric vehicle chargers in 66 cities around our territory. We worked with 11 uh, different EV charging um, companies. The program will result in the equivalent of 1,400 cars coming off the road. 
So all the utilities have programs like this, but where we're also needing to focus right now is actually building up the capacity of the grid. Because when you put one electric vehicle on the grid, I think it's equivalent to about the load of two households. So we're gonna to need to just improve our basic grid infrastructure to accommodate that load. So that's where we're focused. One other area we're looking at, which I think can be, you know, what are solutions that accomplish, address multiple problems? So we're looking at electric vehicles and their ability to support reliability. So you can drive your vehicle during the day, but the ability to plug your vehicle in your home, to your home to serve as backup energy um, at times when the system needs it, or the ability to have your vehicle send power back to the grid. Those are all areas that we've been talking about for years in the state, but given the needs that we're seeing, the, the technical feasibility is starting to become more reality. So we're partnering with car companies, we're talking to other utilities about how we can actually use vehicles in multiple ways on our grid, in addition to having them as a driving resource. All of this just to introduce a sociological note uh, implies greater control from central headquarters. If you're gonna get demand response, if you're gonna get uh, local homeowners with their car in the garage uh, pu uh, pushing electricity back into the grid, that's gonna take a tightly organized system. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna note that uh, here in the wild west, uh, we're contemplating by necessity a definite step up in centralized control. Would you agree or would you disagree with that? So I definitely agree it requires more coordination, more centralized coordination. And that sounds nicer than control, I guess. I'm, I'm learning the politic thing to say, you know. Okay, but I think it's gotta be, if we're gonna make it work, it has to be reliable. To be reliable, you gotta be in charge. When I say you, I mean pg and &E, not the customer. Uh, I mean, the customer can make a choice to go in, but it has to be all predictable and reliable, I would think, to really make it work. No, so like, I don't disagree. I think that having some type of orchestration from a more centralized entity like a utility makes sense. And that's why I like working at utilities. I think we have this real ability to operate things at scale and to coordinate customers. But what we have to do in return is we actually have to show the value proposition to our customers. So one of the things that we've learned over time is you've got to design these programs in coordination with customers, with customers in mind. And if they know that they're going to, it's going to help them get reliable service, that they'll save some money from it, customers are going to be willing. I mean, I'll just tell you on the EV program that we just finished, the demand for the chargers was three times what we were able to provide. And with those programs, we do require customers to go on load management rates. So there is some expectation of doing demand response already if you sign on to getting one of those chargers. So I think customers might be willing, but they want to see the value from it. By the way, let me, what do you mean a charger? I didn't follow, I was thinking car charging and that, that, that you're referring to some other charger, aren't you? No, so um, the programs that pg e has and other utilities have are, we pay for or subsidize electric vehicle chargers. And we're doing chargers that are in apartment buildings, public spaces, residential communities, fleets, et cetera. And so when a customer decides to get a charger that's subsidized by the utility, um, one of the PUC requirements around those programs is to get on electric vehicle friendly rates to do load management. So we're already introducing customers to the idea that in order to be connected to the grid, you have to do it in a responsible way. So it's one step towards having more of that centralized um, operation. I see. And with the sun and the wind only operative certain day, uh, hours of the day, uh, the, the charging and the storage, uh, even though decentralized, all needs to be knitted together uh, with a very sophisticated system. Exactly. It is, we're talking about. Look, the system is more complicated to run than it ever has been. And that's why perhaps you're seeing some of these challenges around the world as grid operators are trying to figure out how to integrate these resources that have a lot of different attributes. It is harder to integrate um, renewables and storage and EVs than it was coal plants and gas plants, but we have to do. So in China, for example, they're starting to burn more coal 
uh, because they have more electrical demand. I often wonder why can't they uh, do more solar? Are, are you able to comment on that? I know they're doing a lot of solar more than anybody, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they're still talking more coal. Is coal just easier? And, and because you do it 24 seven or something, or you can use it 24 um, seven or not, but we, we see. So I, think, I mean, you, you've touched upon it and I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of the current situation in China, but I know they have significant coal supply. They've also invested significantly in solar. And so I do think you face these situations where if you're having supply constraints, it can become yeah, a reaction to go and go back to the fossil fuel that you, you know is going to be available. But we addressed this years ago in California, which is the cost of that, the environmental cost, the health costs associated with burning those fossil fuels like coal just aren't worth it. So what it would be great to see, I mean, I think one of the things that if you look ahead, you ask me, do I think we can get there, right? Do I think we can get there to a zero carbon grid? It would be helped a lot if we were able to make advances in carbon capture and sequestration, advances in biomethane, advances in hydrogen, because it is helpful to have a fuel supply that is easy to store and readily available. And so the more we can do innovations and have breakthroughs in those areas, the easier it is going to be ultimately to provide power 24 seven. How about uh, making hydrogen liquid fuel uh, using solar? I did visit um, someone uh, here in uh, Sonoma County and they were making um, hydrogen. Uh, they had a machine there and right there in, at the facility and it was an experimental, but it was solar. Uh, I take it that must be very expensive. Otherwise, we could just use the sun and make all this hydrogen, which we're not doing. It must have a huge cost barrier. It's, it is very expensive, and it does require a lot of electricity. So you can make hydrogen cheaper from natural gas. But ultimately, it is good to move to the place where you're doing electrolysis. But with everything, like I said, we start off by talking about solar. All renewables used to be much more expensive than they are now. So there is a pathway to lowering costs. Um, but it is does take time, and it is going to require, I would expect, some type of cost and technology breakthroughs. Now, if America and China and India and Europe, if they were, could they uh, create a higher level of collaboration and bring those costs down faster? Do you think the discord in our world uh, is preventing what uh, actually could be done if there was a a, a, a very strong, much stronger spirit of collaboration among those big countries. So I definitely agree that if the countries work together and we really made this a moonshot initiative of the world, things could get done faster. There's, there's no doubt about that. These issues are complex though. I mean, it's not just countries coming together. You have to have different types of stakeholders coming together. You've got to have the technologists with the academics, with the, utilities, commercial customers, oil companies, et cetera. I mean, everyone has got to come together because it's complex. And so it's, you know, I think about where have we as a society come together to address major problems? COVID could be an example, right? I mean, the world community motivated and did the research to come up with vaccines earlier than people thought. So we do have examples of collaboration, but I think it really gets to what level of urgency we prescribe to this issue and our willingness collectively to make um, hard calls. Because there's, no, there's not an easy way out of climate change, but I do believe we can, we can deal with it if we put the effort in. Right, and I would say from my political perspective that the political barriers are such that we're missing out at a increased pace of uh, innovation and, and uh, cost lowering that we're giving up uh, because of our parochialisms and nationalisms and Cold War-isms, if I could call it that. And uh, they all have very good reason why uh, China and the US uh, are angry at each other. Uh, but the, the truth, the larger truth, is whatever the uh, bad things that each country sees in the other, uh, together uh, we are going to be facing increasingly a bad climate. And to avoid those, that general bad, 
we need more uh, joint research, joint uh, R&D of many kinds. So I just put in that, um, that ideology and nationalism is a barrier uh, to the pace of innovation needed to uh, prevent uh, climate disruptions that are coming, but what could be avoided if we were able to rise to a higher level of, of convergence. Uh, let me ask you, about, go ahead. You can. Well, I just say I don't disagree with that. I think we've also got to bust down the silos between um, academic institutions and industry. Um, one of the things that I do is I serve on the advisory board for Sandia National Labs. And there's a tremendous amount of interesting research that's happening in our national labs and our universities. And one of the things we talk about is how do we, do, how do we connect sooner what's happening in the labs with what's happening, what the utilities are needing, what industry is needing, so that we're asking the right questions in the lab and we're getting those technologies sooner, sooner to market. Um, so I just wanted to add that there's a lot, there's a lot of silos to bust through right now. Right. Okay. And by the way, there is a proceeding uh, in Washington under I think section 301 of Commerce Act, I don't know, some federal statute. Uh, to raise tariffs uh, on uh, on imported solar from China because of uh, the Chinese uh, behavior toward the Uyghurs uh, and maybe other things as well, uh, also dumping. So if a 25% tariff is put on solar, uh, what impact? I mean, for example, also, let me take it a step two. If somehow the US and China start decoupling and we have to make our own solar, Tell me how you would see that. What 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 would be required to keep the necessary pace of solar photovoltaic introduction if we're going to have to make most of them domestically? So it's interesting that you raise that. And these types of tariffs have been proposed over several years. And when I looked more closely at this a few years ago, one of the things I was struck by is that ultimately customers pay. Americans pay because we are going to decarbonize our system. Customers want rooftop solar. They want it for lots of reasons. And it's a really important part to play in our energy system. So ultimately, if cost of panels go up, eventually those costs are going to be passed down to the American consumer. I mean, I do believe we live in this world where we can benefit from trade. And in particularly when we're dealing with climate change, the level of investment that we need to really address climate change, both in the energy sector and more broadly, is so significant that we've got to do it at the least cost possible. So I would, um, you know, if I was someone looking at those policies, I would really look at it from perspective of uh, what does this do ultimately to consumer costs? And how do we just support our economy overall? There are so many ways in which the American economy will grow from investments in clean energy. Um, in ways that we we haven't even thought about yet, so I, I think it's just really important to keep keep our keep our mind on the the, the end prize, which is to reduce dangerous climate change. Because if we don't do that, our economy is going to be affected in a negative way, regardless of where the panels come from. Right, uh, and not just the panels, but so many other things that. Uh, if China is going to be subsidizing and America said, we don't like that, even though without the subsidy, California could have never made the progress it did. But uh, saying, okay, uh, if we don't like the subsidy, then uh, maybe the US will have to do that subsidy. And that's called an industrial policy. But to do that is a, uh, a radical change in how the US government has worked with industry. So uh, I would just highlight that maybe we have to go in that direction, uh, but it, it, it will take, uh, from a political point of view, uh, I don't see Congress uh, ad adapting that or adjusting to that too quickly. So we are at the horns of a dilemma. On the one hand, we want to put up barriers to China for various reasons uh, that we don't need to discuss in this program. Uh, but on the other hand, if we're going to go it, uh, maybe not alone, but with Mexico, with Canada, with Europe, with other people, it's going to cost more money. And we're going to have to put up that money. And it's not going to all be PG&E raising their electric rates. It's going to have to be a federal program like 
Biden's got his three and a half trillion. I don't know whether he's going to get some of that, but that's the level at which we're going to solve climate change, not at a more Mickey Mouse lower level. It's, it's gigantic. It's more almost like war. We have to mobilize our talent and our money uh, and our po political. Uh, I mean, I'll say there are a lot of different political and economic levers in play, and we have to acknowledge how they've all contributed. So the US federal government has been very supportive of uh, federal tax credits. Um, that's one of the ways in which we've supported clean energy. Um, and also loans, you know, the DOE loan program was very successful with uh, supporting major projects get built. And so there are a lot of things that are happening at the federal government, but you're right. The actual technology costs, some of that production, other countries have done more, particularly China, to subsidize. And so whenever we look at a policy, we've got to look at the impact if you stop to have that subsidization. And I keep always coming back to the costs always fall down to the consumer. And so where we're really focused on, pg e has a refined purpose statement, and our purpose statement has three parts, delivering for our hometowns, serving our planet, and leading with love. And that leading with love part is kind of new to hear a utility talk about. Yeah, but I've really never heard that connected to pg and &E, I must say. Well, it's what we're about now. And I, what I really love about it is it really gets to taking the time to understand what is going to be the impact to the customer and being transparent and communicating and being honest, saying, this is what we're trying to do. This is what it's going to cost. We are doing this because we will have a long-term relationship with you and we love you. So we want you to be healthy. We want you to be safe. We want the environment to be better. And so if we just take a step back and look at everything we're doing, I think it's important for us to tell people, here's what things cost, but we're going to spend it because we care about each other and we care about our planet. And this is what it takes to do the right thing. It doesn't make it easier. And some people may not be able to afford all the investments that are needed. But what we've been finding is that our customers appreciate us being honest with them and just being upfront about the challenge ahead. Because we are on the front lines of climate change. We are seeing it every day in our hydro facilities, out there in our forest, as we are upgrading our, our grid to prevent wildfire. And so we, I hear you on the urgency. We're, we're seeing our climate change every day before us out there in our service territory. Uh, how would you, and this may be, a, more sensitive, but how would you describe uh, PG&E's uh, working relationship with the legislature, with its staffs, uh, given the complexity of what you've just been talking about, of what we have to do? It takes a very tight working relationship with the lawmakers. Uh, how would you uh, assess that situation? How does that stand today? So, I mean, every day we're working to educate um, members as well as hear from their, their concerns. I and mean, one of the things about leading with love is you listen more. And one of the things I think we could have done better over time is listen, like listen to what people say they need. So one of the things that has been positive over this last legislative session, we've been sharing everything we're doing to fight wildfires and we're getting our own house in order. We've reduced our ignitions significantly, but utilities are responsible for about 10% of fire ignitions. And so even if we get all of our ignitions down to zero, catastrophic wildfires will keep happening if we don't address the spread, if we don't um, help to make communities more wildfire resilient. So I, I do think that people are listening. Um, they understandably want to make sure that we're doing everything we can, that we're being honest, that we're being safe. And so every day we are showing up the best way we know how and um, just hoping over time, our customers understand that more and work in partnership with us. One, uh, substance, one other substantive point, How, what value and do you think it's possible to integrate the California grid uh, with the electric grids in Nevada and Idaho and Utah, Wyoming and what have you, such that we could be getting, for example, wind power, uh, wind uh, generated electricity from Wyoming when the Solar here doesn't work in California because the sun isn't shining. Do you see so that think, as a, how viable or how important is that? So I think one of the things that's just interesting, you know, I always remember that our grids are already interconnected 
whether our markets are connected, right? You know, we, we have transmission lines that go across our states. And last year when we had the reliability shortfalls, one of the drivers was that there was a west-wide heat wave. So, so demand was up across the west. So we weren't able to trade power in the way that we typically do. So I think it is important to look at if we more formally integrate our markets, um, what advantages could we have? How can we leverage the different geographies and resources? Some of the states in the West have a lot of wind. Other states have a lot of solar. Um, you know, we have a lot of energy efficiency. So I do think that there is some greater optimization that can happen. Um, you know, how far we go along that way to make that formal. I think there's several things to figure out, but I think at this point, we can't take anything off the table because the need is so great. So I do think, I talk to utilities across the West all the time about how we can be better coordinating, including on building um, large scale transmission. Good, all right. Well, the only other point I would make is that uh, as you talk about the energy, uh, it's also the, the recipient, the house. Uh, how efficient is it in the mm -hmm. buildings, the stores, all of that? So I don't know uh, where the sources are to retrofit. Uh, uh, do you think we've retrofitted most of our buildings or do we have a long way to go on that? We have a long way to go. Um, I'm sure our regulators at the Energy Commission could tell us more specifically, but as you are aware, California has quite a lot of housing stock that is older. So that wasn't built to efficiency standards. And as we look to, as we look to electrify buildings more, you know, putting solar EVs, um, solar water heaters, one of the things that's been interesting is that realizing that some of those benefits you get from that are lost when homes just don't have sufficient insulation. And you know, I'll share one of the things that projects we've been involved in is electrifying. Uh, homes um, in the Central Valley where the homes are heating right now with wood and propane. Um, and this was an initiative that started in the legislature, went to the PUC, and we've been now working with several communities to provide them all electric homes. And one of the challenges is you go forward and you're ready to provide subsidies for the solar water heater, solar, but the roof is not, is not intact to be able to take on the system. So I think if we're talking about widespread building electrification, there's actually upgrades we're gonna to need to do to homes, both the actual envelope of the home, but also to your point, like insulation and things like that. So there's a lot of untapped potential still um, in the energy efficiency space. So yeah, there's a lot, we've been doing it for 30 or 40 years, but there's still plenty, plenty left. Yeah. All right, I, well, Carl, I think, what? go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say like, to what you're saying, I think people may at times get discouraged when it seems like we've been doing so much and yet there's still so much to do, but we have made progress. And, but recognize there's just a lot to get done. And so we just have to fortify ourselves, frankly, and just keep on keeping on because we don't have a, I don't think we have an option to stop. Nope, we got a big task. Those, by the way, my dogs were barking at a squirrel that uh, came close to the window here. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have done uh, much. Uh, there's much, much more to do, and it's got to be done all over the world. And we at the uh, California China Climate Institute are uh, pioneering ways uh, of greater collaboration across all these ideological barriers, which are multiple uh, uh, internationally and are multiple right here in California, even in Oakland and San Francisco. So. We got to overcome division as we get our act together in the face of a change in climate. So th thanks a lot for very interesting and very, very great to talk to you again. Good to talk to you too. I, I look forward to continuing to be a partner with you and the Institute and just working. All the utilities are interested in doing our part. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you.